Welcome everybody, both on Zoom and on YouTube to our ACM talk tonight, the topic of which is a new neural network for optimal time series processing to be presented by Dr. Chris Elias Smith, co-founder of the company Applied Brain Research. And he is uh, associated with the University of Waterloo. And he is the Canadian Research Chair in Theoretical Neuroscience and the author of two books and director of the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. And his team develops the semantic pointer architecture. Uh, a little bit about our group, the SF Bay ACM professional chapter. There are other chapters uh, associated with ACM in the Bay Area. Uh, we are the professional chapter. Um, our chapter was founded in 1957. Our, our goal is to promote knowledge of modern computing and to create community support networking among people and, uh, and hiring, uh, support hiring uh, among people. We have a $20 annual membership pretty cheap. And uh, if you look at our meetup page, which is there, you'll see our upcoming talks. And if you look at our YouTube channel, you will see many past talks. We generally have two monthly meetings, one on general computing uh, and one on data science. The general computing is anything except uh, data science or big data, that type of thing. Uh, during our meetings, we try to promote networking and give time for job hiring announcements. And we do have joint meetings occasionally with IEEE and other societies. Upcoming in uh, October, in Monday, October 24th, will be introduction to Ray AR, AIR for scaling AI, ML, and Python workloads. And uh, Greg, didn't we have a talk recently uh, that this, I guess, would be uh, addition to? Uh, yes, I believe so. Okay. And I think we may have a uh, professional seminar, which would be like an uh, several hours on a weekend uh, coming up but we haven't uh, got that all uh, organized yet. We are scheduling more talks, so just keep an eye on our meetup page, folks. We are a volunteer organization. All of us are volunteers, uh, and we can always use more volunteers. Uh, one place we can use them is to help with membership services. Um, and also publicity and marketing, and to help organize member benefits promoting our organization. Uh, looks like chat is disabled, but you can put questions in Q and A. <sighs> and uh, questions or technical issues or announcements of jobs or that type of thing. And now to, uh, let's see, actually there was one thing that I know Carl had. Uh, he had an announcement, uh, let's see. I can read it on the, it's on the Q&A. So the announcement is on Wednesday, October 5th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. There'll be an online lecture, Can Computers Create Art? They'll be hosted by the SIGGRAPH uh, San Francisco chapter. So once again, on Wednesday, October 5th, a lecture, Can Computers Create Art? So okay. back to you. Okay, thanks. All right, so uh, the talk tonight is a new neural network uh, for optimal time series processing by Dr. Chris Elias Smith, founder of Applied Brain Research. Um, they have recently discovered a new kind of neural network called a Legendre memory unit, LMU, 
that is provably optimal for compressing streaming time series data. And in this talk, he will describe this network and a variety of state-of-the-art results that have been set using the LMU. He is the co-CEO and president of Applied Brain Research, an advanced AI company. He is the co-inventor of the neural engineering framework, uh, the Nengo neural development environment, and the semantic pointer architecture. His team has developed Spawn, the world's largest functional brain simulation. He won the mm, prestigious 2015 NSERC Paul Lanyi Award for his research. He has uh, published two books, over 120 journal articles, and whoops, and holds the Canada Research Chair in Theoretical Neuroscience. He is jointly appointed in the philosophy, system design, engineering faculties, as well as being cross appointed to computer science. He is the founding director of the Center for. Uh, theoretical neuroscience at the University of Waterloo and has a bacon Erdos number. And I actually, the screen is blanking out the last line there. What is your bacon Erdos number? I believe it's eight. Yes. Eight. And what is a bacon Erdos number? <laughs> uh, so I don't know if people know about the Erdos numbers and the bacon numbers, but basically they're like the number of times you are removed from either having written a paper with somebody who wrote a paper with Erdos or been in a um, like movie or TV series of somebody who's been in one with Kevin Bacon. And you sum those two numbers together and that's your Bacon Erdos number. Okay, and have you been in a production with Kevin Bacon? No, I think I'm I think I'm think three removed from Kevin Bacon and, uh, or no, is it, it might be four and four? I don't know, it's some, <laughs> something like that anyways. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll turn it over to you now, if you like. Sounds good. Let me just uh, quickly share my screen here and start up the slideshow. Uh, is that working? Yes. Excellent. So yes, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And it's great to be here talking to everybody. Um, so what I'm going to be speaking about is definitely data science, uh, looking at neural networks in particular. And I'm going to be talking about this one particular neural network that we uh, discovered or invented recently. But before I do that, I want to get a little bit of context just to make it clear exactly why it matters or you know, what kind of problems are we trying to solve with this particular computational approach, right? this use of neural networks. So this particular network is focused on time series AI. And this is something that you're probably using every day almost now. Um, time series AI includes any kind of problems where the order of the data matters for what you're trying to infer or what you're trying to get your AI to do. So for something like a static image, you don't need to know what image comes before or after it if you're just trying to figure out you know, what's in that image. But for something like a series of words in a sentence, you need to know which words come before and after that sentence in order to understand the meaning of the sentence and you know, uh, analyze it appropriately. So, you know, Many time series problems are familiar. So things like speech recognition, language processing, um, but also any kind of sort of signal data. So anything you typically process with a signal processor of some kind, you can also consider time series data and even things like noise suppression and so on. You can think of these as time series problems, um, which you can apply this network that I'm gonna talk about too. So I just have a couple of examples on the right-hand side there. Um, one is sort of, characterizing the current status of a lot of natural language processing, where some of it's in the sort of solved category, much of it's in the making good progress, and a lot of it's also still really hard. Um, and that's even for the extremely large models that you've no doubt heard about recently, things like GPT-3 and so on. Um, so, you know, we have applied this network to some of those sorts of problems, and I'll give you a little bit of uh, results on that. And then at the bottom, something which seems kind of different might, uh, you know, be, sort of seem a lot unlike language, but of course, a lot of biosignals that we record, you know, the order in which things happen really matters. So the you know, order in which heartbeats uh, beat and you know, what the distance is between those and exactly what their timing is, all of that kind of thing can matter a lot for accurate diagnosis or de early detection of different kinds of diseases and so on. And also show some examples of how this neural network applies to those kinds of cases. 
So the typical way that people have dealt with this time series data is by using something called a recurrent neural network. So I've drawn that in the top right. Um, if you're familiar with neural networks, you probably run into things like convolutional neural networks. Those tend to be feed forward. They're extremely good for things like image processing. But as soon as you want the order of the data to matter, <clears throat> then often you want to kind of tell the neural network in the future what it processed in the past so it can look at the relationship between uh, the time points in the data stream. Uh, and so a recurrent neural network does that. It basically takes its own output and projects it back to its input. So it has a kind of memory you can think of it as. Um, these have traditionally been fairly challenging to train. But in the 90s, uh, there was a kind of recurrent network called an LSTM or long short-term memory, which introduced a lot more structure into a recurrent network. And it made it much more trainable, much more effective for doing a lot of this kind of time series inference. And the LSTM has become known as the most cited neural network of the 20th century. It's also been called one of the most co commercially successful neural networks because of its broad applications for commercial problems. And I've got a little picture of it on the right-hand side there. I'm not really gonna dive into it, but essentially what it does is it has a kind of memory. So it has a way of uh, sort of recording what the data has been up to a certain point. And then it has a bunch of gates which let it either forget information to block the next sort of data stream or manipulate it in various ways in order to construct a representation of the, the data as it's come in in order, in order to make an inference of some kind. And you know what the LSTM does actually changes depending on the data set because you essentially train up the entire thing. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it's very successful in time series data. And that was something that, you know, people had been using pretty much for almost all time series up until about 2012, 2014. Uh, and in that time frame, there was a new kind of neural network proposed called a uh, transformer. And it really overcame some of the core limitations of the LSTM. So some of those limitations include things like it's very difficult to train at large scales. Um, and you know, one of the main things people wanted to do for time series is natural language processing. You know, it's one of the ways that we uh, sort of interact most frequently and one of the most available kinds of data given all of the things that are on the internet and Wikipedia and so on. And so having big models that can help us process all that data is very valuable. And we typically wanna make them as big as possible because the larger the models get, the more effective they are at dealing with natural language processing tasks. Um, but the LSTM, you know, is hard to scale up and hard to make it really big. And it's hard because it's difficult to train. Um, so I have a picture of a bunch of GPUs up there in the right-hand corner. That's what we'd like to be able to run our models on, but unfortunately we can't do that efficiently. Um, and it's because in order to determine what's going to happen at the next moment in time, you need to know the current state of the LSTM. And in order to do that, you have to look at the previous state and the previous state. So you basically always need to be processing serially. Uh, before you can do any training and improve the performance of the model. And that just doesn't really work well on things like GPUs, which are used to more parallel types of processing. Another challenge with the LSTM is that it's a black box. So as I mentioned, you know, it's got a kind of structure, but you don't really know what it's doing after it's been trained. People have done a lot of uh, analysis and attempts to uh, kind of understand what's going on inside the LSTM are not uncommon, uh, as with any neural network but typically it's considered a black box like most other neural networks. And so you don't really know exactly what's going on, what compute, uh, computations are taking place and so on. And then last but not least, the LSTM has been shown to effectively run into troubles when the sequence that it's dealing with is more than about 500 to 1000 time points. So I have a couple of uh, example data points on the right-hand side where you can see that as the length of the uh, information being processed by the LSTM gets longer, the error goes up, right? And so that's a graph of the mean squared error. Um, and it's a log, gra log, log graph, as you can see. And the LSTM gets really bad. You know, it's kind of making a lot of error uh, by the time you get to about a, a thousand time steps. And that essentially just means that you can't really use it for long sequences. And in fact, you know, when we're reading a book or even a paper, of course, all of that information, all the words uh, that came before the ones that we get to the end of the conclusion are informing how we're interpreting that conclusion. And of course, if we can't take that into account, then we're not going to do a great job of sort of understanding text, for instance, for longer texts, especially. Uh, and of course, there's many other kinds of data, um, financial data, where you want lots of data points 
before you make decisions about what to invest in or what have you, and so on, right? So it's not uncommon basically to easy, to quickly get up over that thousand sample barrier. So as I was mentioning, the LSTM was sort of uh, superseded by the transformer because it overcame some of these challenges, not all of them, but some of them. Um, and the, what a transformer is, is basically a neural network that instead of processing the time sort of one after, or like time points one after the other, it takes all of the time points at once and puts it through a feed forward network where it can kind of look for relations between all of the time points um, at once. And of course, this is great from the perspective of doing parallel processing um, because you know now we can use our GPUs to train up really well. And that lets us leverage these you know, massive GPU farms and things that people have. And for that reason, transformers have uh, essentially completely overtaken the LSTMs in terms of being deployed for uh, commercial purposes. And all of the biggest language models and the conversational agents and all these kinds of things are now basically transformers, whether they're coming out of you know, Google or Amazon or Microsoft or any other company. Um, <clears throat> and so really transformers essentially are state of the art for doing this kind of time series processing. And a big part of that is precisely because of this ability to train models at those kinds of scales. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side, I've got an example to show that the transformer also seems to outperform the LSTM for the same size of model. So along the bottom x-axis there is the size of the model in the number of parameters. And along the y-axis is the um, error or the loss. And you can see that you have lower loss, which is good, lower error, um, for the transformer for every size of model compared to an LSTM. Uh, and this is a sort of taken from a recent paper from OpenAI in which they were looking at how do these different kinds of models scale as you get your make your models bigger and bigger and bigger. And they found these kind of power laws where you find these essentially straight lines, which uh, are pretty good for predicting how the model will perform as the model gets larger and larger and larger. Uh, so that's kind of a, a really quick history of time series processing using neural networks. And it brings us to what I wanted to sort of focus on today, which is talking about a new kind of neural network, uh, and that's this Legendre memory unit. Um, and basically, the way that we came up with this network is by thinking about what is a or the sort of fundamental problem that must be solved by any network that's trying to process time series data. Um, and actually, we started looking at this in the context of understanding how the brain functions. As you might have noticed, my background is sort of more in theoretical neuroscience and understanding biological computation, uh, so neural networks, biological neural networks, and how they compute. And so we were trying to understand this in the context of the sorts of processing you see in places like the hippocampus, where um, you can basically record from neurons that are sensitive to when events happen over a time frame. Um, but of course, we didn't want to get into like super complicated uh, tasks that animals perform or dealing with natural language and so on. So we tried to strip it down to an incredibly simple problem that we think is core to all time series processing. And that's this problem I've diagrammed on this slide here. The problem is one of memory. So just remembering what you have seen in the recent past um, or the distance past seems to be critical for being able to make inferences about what's likely to happen in the future or for interpreting the data that you've seen in the past and so on. And so the problem that we've identified as the one to attack was this memory or delay problem. And I've diagrammed it here, you know, you've got one input coming in sort of streaming data. So it just, it just keeps coming in uh, online real time. And what you wanna do is take that gold signal and delay it by let's say one second. And if you did that, it would turn into the blue signal. So the input's the gold signal, the system wants to basically memorize that signal and then stick it out one second later, looking exactly the same as it did when it came in. And if you do that, of course, what you're basically doing is memorizing one second of that signal. And the surprising thing about what I think seems like a fairly intuitive and simple problem is that as I've described it so far, it's actually an infinitely difficult problem. Um, and the reason is because I didn't put any constraints on the signal that I'm sticking into my system. So if that signal had extremely high frequencies, right, if it really was perfectly continuous in time, it could take on any value at any moment in time, then you would have to store an infinite amount of information, you know, even for a short delay, like one second. Now, uh, because it's infinite dimensional or infinitely difficult, it means that you can't really solve it with finite resources, finite computational resources. Um, so instead, what you want to do is say, okay, well, I'm not going to solve this infinite dimensional problem or infinitely difficult problem. How can I sort of 
get the best possible approximation to that uh, to the sort of optimal solution for an arbitrary delay problem. And that's really what the Legendre memory unit does. This, this uh, Legendre memory unit has at its core something that we sometimes refer to as the Legendre delay network. And really the purpose of that is just to provide the optimal finite solution to that infinitely difficult problem. So if I said to you, you've only got six neurons, but I want you to do the best possible job you can of you know, delaying this input signal, then this network will provide that for you. And I should probably emphasize that it's very rare to have any kind of proofs about the performance of a neural network. Um, and so, you know, we were pretty excited to be able to say, hey, you know, this is the optimal solution to this time series problem, simple time series problem of just doing delay. Um, but we think that's probably pretty core to all kinds of other time series problems. And so this graph is just showing it working. Um, and this is just a six dimensional uh, neural network that's basically taking this blue line as its input and then outputting this uh, uh, green line, which you can see is basically laying right on top of the uh, dashed blue line, which would be the ideal answer. And this is uh, just sort of introducing a brief about one second delay. So what I want to do now is give you a bit of a, an intuition. I'm not going to go through all the math to prove it, but I just want to give you an intuition of really what this network is doing. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you know, we've got uh, basically uh, one second of time plotted along here. And at the very beginning, this is the stimulus that we show the network. Uh, and in this case, we've implemented it in spiking neurons and things, because as I mentioned, you know, we're interested in biological networks, but you can kind of ignore that part. Uh, and what's in C here is basically saying what the network thinks happened half of a second ago after it's sort of tried to memorize one second of input. And so, you know, it sees all of this input, and then we can ask it, uh, right here, what did you see half a second ago? And this is what it would say. It would say, oh, you know, there was something um, that looked like a bump coming into my input. Uh, and the way it's doing that is sort of diagrammed in the bottom here, where, uh, you know, for each neuron, we're basically showing, you can think of this as like the activity of that neuron. And uh, so for a little while, there's no input, so none of them have any activity. And then we get this Gaussian bump, and then you see a bunch of activity occur, and then the activity keeps updating itself because basically that bump is sort of sliding into the past. And so this recurrent network that we built is telling itself that, you know, this thing is moving into the past, I'm not getting any more input, and it's essentially recording over this one second interval from 0.05 to 1.5, you know, what the uh, state was some length of time ago. And you can plot that in this top graph where this is basically showing for any time in the past, what would it look like if we decoded, right? So at the end of one second, we can say, what you know, what did things look like one second ago? And you can see you get a nice tight bump, or you can say, what looks like, what did things look like uh, half a second ago? And you get this sort of dashed line where it's saying, oh, well, half a second ago, half a second in the past, there was a bump, right? And so on. And you can essentially see that bump kind of sliding its way uh, sort of into the past uh, from where you start. So to summarize, we basically have this one-dimensional input stimulus. It's being projected up into this higher dimensional, six-dimensional space in this case. That six-dimensional space is um, dynamically updating itself in order to take into account all of the input subsequent to any of the uh, sort of input stimulus changes and so on. And in doing so, it's essentially memorizing one second worth of information. And so at any point in time, you can say, what happened? And then pick any time one, you know, in the window between now and one second in the past, and it can try to reproduce for you what the uh, time state was, or what the state was of the network across the entire window. Okay, so. so the, a question, so the number, the number of polynomials is a limiting factor to the frequency that you can support? That's exactly right, yeah. So in the infinitely difficult case, we need an infinite number of those uh, coefficients, right. which is what we're showing here, this like six dimensional thing. Um, but yeah, you know, if we can frequency limit the inputs uh, signal, then we can actually figure out how many do we need in order to get what degree of accuracy in the representation of the input state. Sure. Okay, so um, so that's basically the core intuition that I wanted to get across. And uh, then I'm gonna now basically show you lots of results and interesting things that we can do once we have that sort of core insight. So the thing that I, basically showed you is this linear system right here. Um, these matrices, which can, you can think of these as weight matrices, but essentially we derive those. 
So we know exactly how to set them in order to make them optimal. And then we put a nonlinear layer like everyone does, and you know we'll train up these other weight matrices. Um, but this sort of core linear part is the part that we have the optimality proof about. So we just kind of have those claims along left-hand side that this LMU is optimally compressing temporal information, that we can derive it from first principles, um, and we can show that it has state-of-the-art performance, which I'll show you in a minute. And it's also nice that it explains time cells in the brain, um, that you can use it on spiking hardware. It's very robust to uh, noise and all kinds of other sort of really interesting features. And of course, we can train it in a feed-forward way if we want using uh, lots and lots of GPUs. Uh, so, you know, it kind of solves the problems that LSTMs had, even though we've defined it in this diagram as a recurrent network, we can also do essentially a feed-forward version of that linear system and train it uh, efficiently across large numbers of uh, GPUs. So let me just quickly take you through some of the results. Uh, you know, one of the first things we did was compare it to that LSTM. And, you know, as the LSTM has more and more time steps, of course, it gets worse and worse, as I showed. For the LMU, actually, as it gets more and more time steps, it gets better and better. This is a little bit counterintuitive, but the reason is because you're essentially taking a signal and you're discretizing it more and more finely. And the LMU really, you know, is derived to be a continuous dynamical system. So the more finely you discretize its input, actually, the better it does as far as being able to uh, reduce the mean squared error. Um, so you see this very significant improvement, um, and it also uses about 80 times fewer parameters than the one that we, the LSTM that we're comparing it to here. And so this lets us make these claims like it's a million times more accurate, right? Because you've got 10 to the six improvement in accuracy, and it rem remembers 10,000 times more data because we're getting up close to 100,000 data points. Um, and actually, we pushed it over a million, and it does all this with 80 times fewer parameters. So that's kind of like the best case comparison. <clears throat> but let's look at more sort of benchmarks and uh, state-of-the-art applications. Uh, so the first thing we did was compare it to basically what all recurrent neural networks are generally tried out on. Uh, this is called PSMNIST, um, kind of like, you know, you have a new vision system and you try MNIST on it, uh, although nowadays it's more like ImageNet. Um, in this case, you know, basically what we're showing is that this LMU is significantly outperforming essentially every other uh, technique that people have tried in the past. And really all of the ones like this LMU, HIPPO, leg S, and R model, those are all LMU-based uh, neural networks. And you can see that they have a pretty significant increase in advantage over the best other network, right? So it really does seem like it's doing something differently. Um, and we think that's basically coming down to that optimality proof we were talking about. We can then apply this to something which is actually useful in the real world. Um, so this is keyword spotting. So, you know, if you want to control your earbuds or something, you just want to say some words to it, have it pick those up and decrease the volume, increase the volume, et cetera, et cetera. This is something that people have done lots of optimization on networks for. And in fact, Google put out a paper about two years ago where they took all of the best networks they could find. Um, they made them all streaming. They trained them as best they could and then compared them. And that's all these results over here. Um, and what we're showing is this x-axis is the size of the model. And essentially, you can see a kind of Pareto optimal front where, you know, for any size of network, uh, we can match uh, anybody's sort of accuracy and in fact, make the model smaller or for the same size network, um, you know, do better, have a lower or a higher accuracy on this particular problem. Um, and so, yeah, this was, you know, a nice early result demonstrating that the LMU really translates well into a real world application. Uh, We've also applied this to lots of other things. This is just another example on a radio frequency classification data set. So you've got a bunch of uh, sort of encoded information and there's you know, many different ways of encoding information into radio frequencies, but you might not know how that was encoded. And so we can, uh, we're showing here a network which is basically listening to the raw RF signal and then telling you what kind of encoding was most likely to be used. Uh, and this is a fairly challenging problem. And on, in this case, we're showing that it's significantly outperforming current state of the art and is also relatively small while doing so. Uh, separate example, looking at um, doing R peak detection. So this is detecting when a heartbeat occurs. This is a very challenging problem in this case because this is a wearable. And so people are moving around a lot and you know the sensor is shifting on the skin, people might be sweating and so on. Uh, and so here we basically are building an LMU which is really small. Uh, I've got sort of different sizes on the right-hand side there. But we can see that in every case, it's significantly outperforming um, what this particular client was using, um, which is kind of a standard off-the-shelf state-of-the-art kind of technique. Um, but you can uh, sort of see that, you know, we are able to get a sort of raw improvement score on the order of 14 to 15% um, while still dealing with extremely noisy data. Um, 
Moving to sort of larger models and things that look more like you know natural language processing and so on. Um, the first three comparisons here are to LSTMs. So you can see in every case, you know, we're outperforming the LSTM across a bunch of different kinds of data sets um, while being you know much, much smaller, like uh, hundreds of parameters smaller and so on. Um, but as I mentioned, sort of LSTM comparisons isn't really where the uh, money is, as it were, right now. And so down here, we also have a comparison to a uh, sort of transformer model. And you can see that you know, we're be beating a Distilbert, which is a transformer model, in accuracy while using about half the number of parameters. Um, and in more recent work, we actually can show that that is a trend which should continue for pretty much any NLP task that you want to do. So this is the same graph that I showed before, comparing LSTMs to transformers. But now we've also plotted uh, LMU performance here. So as you know, the uh, numbers go to the right, the model is getting larger and larger. And you can see that the LMU has basically got this nice slope, which is a sort of bigger improvement over transformers than transformers have over LSTMs. And so you can either read this as, you know, for any given size model, you're going to get the best model using an LMU, or for a given sort of level of accuracy, you can reduce the number of parameters by about half. Um, so again, you know, this is the kind of thing which can be very advantageous for reducing your um, power consumption running in the cloud or for making sort of effectively larger models being running at the edge on edge networks or on edge hardware, I should say. Uh, and one of the reasons that you get this kind of improvement is actually that the LMU has a kind of fundamental uh, uh, advantage when it comes to scaling. So transformers are typically scaling as n squared. So n is the sequence length. So that's like the number of time points that you look at before you make your inference. Transformers scale as about n squared in compute and memory, whereas the LMU scales as order n log n in compute and all n in memory when you run it in feed forward. Um, and actually, I'm missing a line here because if you run it as a recurrent network, then it's O n in compute and constant time in memory. Uh, and that's even sort of more important uh, when you're, for instance, running in a sort of fixed resource constrained environment like at the edge. And um, what is the intuition behind that? Is it because the you're using the basis functions or the Legendre polynomials and they're a lot more complex than a straight linear function that, uh, uh, that would be used in a neural net uh, input vector? So, I mean, the, the reason that you get this compute improvement is because the transformer is essentially looking at every possible time point and comparing it to every other time point. So that's kind of where your okay. n squared comes from. Whereas okay. what the Legendre memory unit is doing is it's taking all of that data and compressing it into this uh, n-dimensional representation. And so for memory, it's constant time because you just have, you know, once you have that number of polynomials, that's the same number of polynomials you have for all the time. Um, and then the compute, yeah, it just needs to basically be looking across that uh, data once in order to make the inference. Okay. Uh, right, so next steps for ABR and the LMU. So we kind of have these you know, nice results. Um, I guess I could point out that we first proposed the LMU in at the end of 2019, so kind of 2020-ish. Uh, and then we've been gathering all these kinds of software types of results and then also looking at you know, its application in a wide range of areas and talking to clients, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so one of the main things that we've uh, focused on recently is building hardware which natively runs this LMU. Uh, and the reason that we do, are doing that is because it lets you get not only the sort of uh, algorithmic advantages I've been talking about, but when you build a hardware that is essentially is built for a particular algorithm, it can be extremely efficient. And so in this case, we're expecting it to be on the order of about 100x less power than what you'd be using standard edge hardware for when running like NLP and ASR types of models. Um, so the chip can do uh, automatic speech recognition, natural language processing, but also just kind of arbitrary uh, sensor data processing. And it's also going to be very inexpensive, again, because it doesn't require a lot of hardware in order to do a fairly big model. Um, so we think it's going to basically be on the order of about $4 per chip, um, which is much less than what you'd be paying for uh, hardware running equivalent size models of transformers and so on. It's also going to be very energy efficient on the order of 25 milliwatts. So we've done lots of sort of profiling and modeling of the energy use of the chip. Uh, and again, that means you can run it battery powered I, uh, in IoT, or it can just kind of give you back five watts of power to use on some other um, you know, part of the system that you're trying to run. Usually at the edge, you know, battery power and power envelopes are one of the most critical resource constraints. Um, and it also uh, can uh, be very fast. So because it's doing all this in real time, it does uh, essentially um, streaming data compression, 
it can have very low latencies, which is something that's, again, important when you're building user interfaces and so on, uh, let alone if you're trying to make rapid decisions, if you're you know, in an environment where things are happening quickly, then that kind of uh, reduced latency can be extremely important. So a couple sort of quick examples. Um, hey, Christopher. One of our clients uh, was interested in using this in this sort of ASR NLP case. And so what we did was build a climate control system. So it's a dialogue manager, which is using this technology in order to let you control just the um, climate in this particular case inside your car. Uh, so I'll play that. Hopefully you can hear it. It might be a little quiet. It's still pretty cold in here and I forgot my gloves today. Do you want me to heat the steering wheel? Yeah, that would be great. What should I set the heat? Uh, what are the options? I can set the heat to low, medium, or high. Uh, let's do medium heat in that case. The steering wheel is now set to medium heat. Okay, great, thanks. Hey, Christopher. I'm having trouble seeing the road. Do you want me to defog the windshield? So you'll notice that yeah, this is a very sort of natural language kind of okay. interaction. The so the user just said, That's I'm nice. having a trouble seeing the road and the system could figure out, oh, well, that means that you know I should do something to the windshield. The air conditioner. Uh, and this is a really big improvement over typical more keyword spotting types of applications or key sentences. And you know, for users to adopt these sorts of um, interfaces, being able to just use natural language in this sort of way makes a ton of sense. And the kind of thing that we're doing here would take on the order of two or three chips, um, whereas now it's you know basically got an entire uh, sort of edge GPU type of chip uh, dedicated to doing that sort of processing. And uh, it also sends a lot of the data off the vehicle, which again is a problem for safety reasons sometimes, as well as um, just significantly increasing the latency and so on. So you know this sort of dialogue use case, I think, is a really nice example of what you can do when you can basically put more powerful language models at the edge. Um, and then another example, this is another interface example. What we're doing here is basically showing, you know, uh, we're, we're building an autonomous drone system, which is just like another entire talk. But, you know, part of that is it needs to be easy for people to use in complicated scenarios. So here you can imagine this is a disaster scenario where there's been a flood and uh, there are rescuers who are want to use the drone in order to find people or, you know, evaluate what this circumstance is. Um, and so this is another case where, you know, you can uh, basically implement one of these uh, recognition systems directly on the drone because it's just uh, such low power. Drone, can you start searching for civilians? And of course, you don't need to train people how to fly drones and all that other kind of stuff. You just basically have them ask what they want the system to do. Oh, I think I see someone. Can you go east? Okay, I was right. Can you move closer to civilian one? Hmm. They seem hurt. Drone, please monitor civilian one. Okay, I see that a rescuer is on their way to the civilian. You should go pick up a first aid kit. Go to position three for a pickup. All right, so you know, same same kind of thing here that you can just say things with very natural language. People don't have to be precise about remembering. Uh, you know exactly what the correct command is, which of course is definitely something you don't want to force people to do in stressful situations. Um, and so, nice. yeah, it's kind of a nice addition to this autonomous system um, that has all kinds of other cool features too that I won't talk about, like adaptive control and so on. Um, but yeah, just another uh, sort of demo of the kind of thing that you can do with this uh, LMU technology quite easily. Um, so yeah, that's basically really what I wanted to talk about. I'm happy to uh, take questions. Um, just as a quick summary about the company Applied Brain Research uh, that I'm representing. You know, we do lots of things. So LMU is kind of one of them. So LMU licenses as well as chips, uh, but we also actually provide general tools for doing uh, edge development. So if you, you know, have a data set, we have a platform you can go to nengo.ai or edge.nengo.ai. And if you go there and upload your data set, pick a, an architecture and a type of hardware and then hit optimize, it will kind of do all of that for you. And then you can just uh, take the results and deploy it locally. Um, we also do lots of AI engineering, you know, building these autonomous systems like I showed uh, for uh, many different clients, DoD and otherwise. And um, yeah, just kind of, you know, all kinds of advanced AI stuff, which again, I'm not really here to talk too much about, but I thought I would just mention it uh, in case it was of interest. And then last but not least, 
uh, you know, we have about 20 people in the company. Uh, this is our executive team that covers sort of all of these areas, uh, including software platforms and application development, as well as uh, autonomous, autonomous systems and hardware. And uh, that's about it. I just was going to uh, leave it there and open the floor for questions. Yeah, so there's a question I can read from James. It says, small enough prove that the highest accuracy model is one that memorizes the available sense data in the smallest turn complete description or algorithm. It minimizes the parameters considered as executable binary bits. <clears throat> Since only RNNs can be among the NNs be Turing complete and LMU is an RNN, in what sense does it, is it optimally relate to the small enough optimality? Um, right, so I am not familiar with Sol Solomonov's, <laughs> I don't know if I can say that either. Solomonov's proof. Um, but so just from what you have said in the question, um, I think he's asking. Yeah, essentially, why is it better than is, RNNs at a, in a provable level? Oh well, so it is an RNN, right? right. And I think it, it basically would just be uh, consistent with small enough proof, right? So what we're saying is that this uh, particular RNN is one that we can show has the lowest error, so the minimum mean squared error for any uh, sort of input <clears throat> that a number of resources that you've provided for it. And so if small enough to prove that, I should look it up because it sounds like he's essentially, you know, proved the other half, which is the thing that we showed empirically, which is that, you know, if we apply it to all these different kinds of uh, problems that it, you know, tends to outperform the systems which don't basically can't guarantee that kind of um, optimality in the representation of the original input data. So yeah, I take that to be it's super helpful, actually. <laughs> I'll, I'll look into it more. Okay. Yeah. And then another question from... Uh, Shailesh is what kind of technology and programming languages are used to develop the application? Uh, so um, I think, yep. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So basically, all of the uh, uh, interfaces that we use are pretty much Python. So, you know, like most machine learning, we've actually released a Keras LMU uh, library. So you can download that and, you know, try the LMU out on your own favorite time series data set if you want. Um, our Ningo software development environment uses Python essentially as the high level description language, which then compiles into neural networks and so on. Excuse me. Um, and then the edge uh, software stack that I talked about, um, that's more of a like point and click. So where you're just like selecting, you know, exactly what architectures you want. You can set a bunch of hyperparameters and all that kind of stuff. But uh, right now that doesn't let you sort of um, programmatically specify exactly what you want the network to look like. Uh, we expect to do something like that more down the road when we combine those two software stacks. But yeah, uh, so that will also be Python. But right now you, um, yeah, do more of this kind of point and click okay. case for the uh, online stuff, yeah. Um, an anonymous person said, is it extendable to multidimensional? I assume a time series that has, you know, multiple sensors coming in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent. In fact, all of the, the um, natural language processing examples that I showed, you know, the very first thing you do with the words is you convert them into 300 or 500 dimensional vectors, and then you process those all in parallel. And that's exactly what we're doing. We have basically a big, huge uh, parallel LMU where you can then mix across all of the dimensions in order to do something which looks a lot like attention, um, but we're doing it, we call it implicit attention because it, typically when people are doing attention in a transformer, they basically take those word, those 300 dimensional word representations and then do self-attention across all of them explicitly kind of in that word embedding space. What we're doing is we're taking that word embedding space, encoding it as a LMU vector space, and then doing this kind of attention within that LMU encoding. So it's not the actual words, it's this sort of compressed version of the words. So we call that implicit attention. Um, and it turns out to be, you know, more effective and scalable and all that kind of fun stuff. But yeah, definitely, you know, very high dimensional input data is not a problem. Um, so a question I have, I tend to work more on vision projects. Um, yep. There's been beginning work to start working on transformers for vision, where the transformers yep. are re replacing a CNN. So the attention part is, is uh, handling the convolution instead of convolution. Um, yep. Is yours, uh, would your work be extensible to uh, vision problems? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and in fact, so we have applied it to things like uh, gesture recognition and all those sorts of uh, kinds of problems. 
the thing we've typically found, so I actually, the work you're talking about is more recent and what we should do is go back and try and apply it uh, in the sort of way that people have done transformers recently to vision data. But so early on, people were, you know, doing time series processing of video, of vision data, typically with video. And most of the data sets we could find are all very short time scale, right? So you typically only have, you know, like at most 20 to 40 frames before you're making a gesture recognition decision or something like that. Um, and that essentially doesn't show the advantages of the LMU nearly as well. So we could build systems that use the LMU and it would be state of the art and it would be, you know, slightly more, uh, efficient, but it wouldn't be like double the efficiency like we're seeing in these other time series application areas. Um, and so, yeah, we haven't spent as much time essentially doing the optimization for the uh, vision and video types of data. Um, if, you had but, a, yeah. if you had a high frame rate, I imagine you would probably be good at uh, semantic segmentation yeah. and probably tracking the objects over time. Uh, yeah, for sure. Basically, the longer the time series gets, the more advantage we think we're going to have, right? So if people did have super high frame rate, and they wanted to be tracking over thousands of frames or making decisions after thousands of frames, then yeah, for sure, we'd expect a bigger advantage. But we just okay. haven't seen a lot of that. Um, I mean, if you have, if you know of cases, we would definitely be interested to, to talk about it. Yeah, I definitely do. I can okay. message you offline. Yeah, please uh, do. Anonymous attendee, are you familiar with sinusoidal representation networks or SIREN? Oh, sorry, uh, another question. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So these, uh, actually, I think this is um, not unrelated to, you know, when people started doing the transformer work, they also started looking at other ways of doing vision transformations before the encoding and doing things like sinusoid representations is something that you can also do. Uh, and in fact, you know, we're talking about Legendre networks here because <clears throat> that's what we originally did the proof in, but we've tried out many other basis functions as well, like horror wavelets and uh, sinusoids and all kinds of other things. Um, they generally have to be slightly altered um, from, you know, kind of the, the standard Fourier transform and things that you would think because you're doing something more over a window. And so there's these edge effects, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, they're very closely related, I think, to um, using this kind of encoding that we're talking about. And basically, in all of these cases, I think you're constructing what looks like an efficient memory or sort of efficient, you know, just reproduction of the input data in such a way that you can then do some interesting nonlinear sort of inference on it. Um, so yeah, I think, again, these, these are the right kinds of intuitions to have, but it's a similar class of network that we're uh, working with here. Right, okay, very good. Um, other questions from the audience or anything from uh, YouTube to get pasted into the Q&A? Um, so if I was interested in looking more into uh, the the uh, vision application, uh, would I what search on your GitHub? Would there be examples of that? Um, actually, we haven't published the vision stuff, so we have that kind of in-house. OK. Um, yeah, so if you want us to talk more about that, we should yeah just talk directly, and we can sort of show you the kind of stuff that we've done Okay. on the vision so, side. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I guess I could also make the comment just in that context that uh, you know the chip is also designed for multi-dimensional, but not the kind of high-dimensional data that you get for vision systems, right? So again, you know, we sort of targeted things down to all the other kinds of data streams that you find that aren't quite as high-dimensional as vision systems, which is you know one of the highest dimensional types of data you tend to run into, um, right. and so that's one of the reasons it's small and inexpensive and so on. But it does turn out to be really effective for things like language and. Uh, audio processing, audio scene analysis, network monitoring, financial data analysis, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, a lot of excellent problems and your results look really good. Uh, yeah, especially, yeah. I like the, you know, looking at the comparison uh, by the number of weights or the complexity. So that's good. Um, mm -hmm. There's another question from YouTube. Uh, so William said, have you tried redoing the GPT-3 using this? So, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, that, um, uh, can I quickly go back here? So that graph that I showed, right? So this graph you can see goes up to like, uh, these are non-embedding parameters. This is like, you know, a 6 million parameter network. GPT-3 is 175 billion parameters. We do not have the resources to train models like that. You know, few companies do. We've now trained things over 60 million parameters. And, you know, this line continues in a straight line, just like you would expect. Um, so, you know, if you know somebody who's got big enough computers and would like to spend the, you know, 
million or $2 million to train the network at the size of GPT-3, we think that they would find a big benefit to using an LMU. But unfortunately, that's not something we can afford. Um, oh, so would, yeah. would uh, uh, training and scalability be inherently um, parallel if you had had hundreds of your hardware modules um, and you had a high interconnect between them? Oh, so our the hardware that we're uh, developing is for uh, inference. So it's for deployment, not for training. Okay. Um, yeah, so we train all this stuff on big GPU farms like everybody else, right? And okay. uh, yeah, and then once you've trained it, then that chip basically will let you do the inference. And the chip has on the order of 30 million parameters uh, that it can support. So you can you know do like a effectively 60 million parameter model, which gets you into sort of like the mid-sized NLP models that people are typically deploying these days. Um, again, you know, not up to the 175 billion parameter scale. Um, but yeah, I don't think anyone's, you know, thinking of deploying that stuff at the edge anytime soon. But we think that you can do a lot with these sort of medium sized models and also, you know, put 10 chips together and get 320 million parameters. Now you've got like what is a fairly significant, significantly sized model. And the, the, the way to think about this is that, you know, uh, models like TPT3, they're memorizing like the entire internet. Right, so you, you ask them, hey, who wrote How to Build a Brain? And I'll say Chris Eliasmith. Like that's a useless piece of information that nothing at the edge should ever know. Um, <laughs> what, you, what, you, what you really want to do is train these models to do co have conversations, understand language well enough to you know carry the conversation on, understand what to go and look up on the internet if it has to go do that. Right, and so for obscure uh, facts like the one I just said, you know, that's a thing where you should really shouldn't. It should be going off off chip and. Um, you know, figuring out the uh, the details of that in a different way. Okay. Um, yeah. Another, I have uh, three more questions on the list. Uh, sure. Ted is asking, following up on the earlier question, Vision Transformer, or VIT, learns an embedding for 16 by 16 patches that's not one-dimensional linear. Do you think the LMU could be easily adapted to handle this 2D grid of patches? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So. There's sort of no constraints on the shape or size or dimensionality of the input that can be put into one of these LMUs. So the, the only thing that uh, you kind of need to know, right? So actually having this slide up is not a bad one. So you know the reason that you have this ON squared thing is because uh, like for however many inputs that you've got, right? You have to take that many inputs and like I was saying, compare it to all the other inputs. Um, and so for the LMU, what you're doing instead of that big, huge n squared computation is you're memorizing the n thing into your q. Let me call it so the number of dimensions that you've got in your uh, in your Legendre memory unit, and q is generally much much smaller than n, right? And so there's there's no constraints on the size of the original data or the structure that it has. All you're doing is kind of mapping it from that into some space and it turns out to be a linear map, but it's one which, yeah, you know, can be applied to any any size of input. And so if you wanted to do 16 by 16 patches, you could do that. Um, and then you'd probably have Q by Q uh, memory elements. And you could, again, make Q much smaller than, uh, well, in that case, it would be like 16 by 16 by the number of time points you've got, right? So right. then you make Q a lot smaller than the number of time points that you've got. So you'd have 16 by 16 by Q as opposed to 16 by 16 by N. But yeah, it would be the, the same idea as in the transformer. Okay. Um, and then uh, Daniel was asking, have you applied LMUs to multi-dimensional, multi-signal time series in healthcare, such as classification tasks using multiple ICU streams um, using MIMIC? Um, so we have done that. So you know, there's a, or I shouldn't say we have done it. We are working with a client now to uh, start doing that. So in this case, it's, looking at a um, uh, sort of uh, fluid that's being extracted from somebody after a surgery. And there's a whole bunch of biomarkers in this that they can sort of extract from the fluid. And this again, gives you a time series and you can see in that fluid, you know, is there a problem of some kind, right? And so this is a case where you're taking sort of multi-dimensional, you know, very different dimensions. So you, you can, some of them are like biomarkers, some of them can be like acidity and, and so on and so forth and taking all of those together and doing inference about, you know, what the, what's the probability that there's been a sort of problem in this uh, particular person. Uh, and so, yeah, again, you know, doing all of the kind of mixing and matching that you'd expect of cross dimensions in order to do inference over time is definitely, you know, exactly one thing that the LMU does. And we definitely have uh, 
applications where we have done that in the biomedical case, we're kind of in the process of doing it, I think more accurately. Okay. Um, here's another question, or it sounds like a suggestion as well uh, from James. The Hutter Prize is del deliberately limited in terms of hardware resources to permit advances in algorithms to win. Has anyone looked at applying LMU to winning the Hutter Prize? No, I have not heard of the Hutter Prize. Is it so H U D E R? H U T T E R, Hutter Prize. Ah, interesting. Um, limited in terms of hardware resources. So it sounds like that would be a yeah, sweet spot. Which is great. Yeah. Yeah, really, that's the optimality proof, right? So the optimality proof is with limited resources. This yes. is the best that you can do for, yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, from YouTube again, William, uh, you said you're 40X smaller, right? And I, I think your slide up here gives the answer with the order of operations. Um, so, right. So here, right, the thing is that basically the scaling depends a little bit on the particular natural language processing task. So these ones, 160, 650, 60x smaller, that is for you know these particular data sets compared to an LSTM. This is more like a general purpose language model, right? So typically what these these were kind of like trained on these data sets. What people do nowadays <clears throat> is really chain up a language model and then apply the language model to you know fine tune it to like a huge number of data sets. So in this instance, you know, we're tra training up a general language model and then applying it to IMDB. Um, and so I would say in general, we would say half, right? So usually it's about half the number of parameters to get the same accuracy. And here we're showing, a, you know, an improvement with just about half compared to a transformer. And then this is this is language model again, right? So just looking at how good a job can you do at uh, minimizing the loss for a language model. Okay. Uh, Ron is asking, can it be applied to dynamical systems like reservoir computing? If yes, how does it compare? Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, again, uh, like an optimal reservoir computer, right? So uh, reservoir computers, you just take a sort of and random projection was, between all the neurons. And so your dynamical system is just generating a bunch of sort of random temporal bases. Um, and in this instance, what we're doing is basically optimizing that. And so it's going to be, and actually we have done comparisons directly to um, to uh, reservoir computers and it's way, way better. And the computational scaling is also way, way better because they reservoir computers also scale as n squared. Uh, and so, yeah, we actually have a, a paper on that. Actually, I'm not sure if, anyways, if the results aren't in a paper, they're in a PhD thesis that I can point you at, which is written by the student that, uh, you know, I worked with to do develop the kind of core technology here. Um, so happy to send people references to the thesis and so on, but yeah, it's definitely a lot better than uh, reservoir computers. Okay. Um, and then just from myself, uh, would you be able to post a PDF of the slides up on the meetup? Underneath the meetup, there's a, like a section below that you can discuss uh, for this event. So if you could just post a link there, that would be great. Okay, is that sort of in Zoom? Uh, no, not in Zoom, in the meetup site. A lot oh, of times okay. people ask for a copy of the slides. And so if you scroll down to the bottom of the meetup page for tonight's event, then there's a comment section. And then uh, in the comment section, you can just add a comment and say, um, you know, here's a link to the slides for this uh, talk tonight. Or yeah, you, sure. you can send a link to us and, and we can put it there, whichever way you like. Yeah, yeah, I think I have a meetup link in the email that you sent me, so I can probably do that, no problem. Sure. Okay. Um, so I see Rajiv Seth raised his hand. I'm not sure. Roger, you can you put something in the Q&A then if you have a question? Don't know why you're raising your hand, Roger. So in this diagram with the linear and the nonlinear, where is the, the actual uh, Legendre curves? Are they in the, I assume they're in the nonlinear layer or is it a linear combination of those nonlinear curves? Well, so this is the interesting thing is that the Legendre basis is never there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right? no. It's it's only the coefficients on the basis that you ever need to sort of process and generate and all that kind of stuff. And then if you want to convert your representation in that linear system back into the time domain, right, then you need to know what the Legendre basis is. So this this matrix M here, that's the memory. And so if we project that memory like the treat those as coefficients over the Legendre basis, then you can reconstruct what's actually in the memory. 
And this so, is why I was making this claim that it's not a black box in the same way that most neural networks are, right? Because you can actually see what the content of the uh, system is that's being processed explicitly as a temporal signal. Okay. Yeah. So, and then how does it have uh, something that's attention-like? Can you explain that in this diagram or another? No, actually, so that's not in this diagram. Yeah, that's, so the uh, architectures that we're using to generate these uh, is different and I didn't actually show you the architecture. Um, okay. And so in that one, basically you, uh, the architecture is you've got your input words that are have been you know projected into some embedding space um, that then goes into an LMU. So just like the thing that I showed you or an LDN, I should say, so like that linear system. Uh, and then through a fully connected layer, <clears throat> which is like the nonlinear layer in the original LMU, um, and then into a, um, uh, or sort of get split out into, you know, your Q, uh, K and V layers, like standard attention, but it's now working on this sort of implicit encoding of the original input. Uh, and then through like a softmax as per usual, and then you just have a whole bunch more of those, right? So then you can put like multiple of those uh, components like people always do for, for these uh, transformer style models. So it really looks a lot like a transformer in some ways, but you just kind of do a special encoding and then you do the uh, the attempt self-attention after you've got the um, uh, encoded representation. Do you have any examples of like model description or given some kind of reasons? I mean, if you have the attention, um, does that, you know, if you're doing an inference on a particular stage of time series, a uh, particular time frame, does it say, oh, I'm waiting this much back in time as my major inputs that are most important to this forecast? Um, so you can you can do the same kind of like decoding that people do of attention networks where it's sort of, you know, things like highlight depending. It, right. In that case, you're actually, it's, it does it in the uh, LDN space. So if you wanted to put it back into the time space where you actually, then you'd have to do that sort of projection on the, yeah, transformation again. Exactly, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, your comment made me think of something else. Uh, but now it's slipped my mind. Okay. Um, an anonymous <laughs> person said, is there a public domain code base available to download and include in prototyping? So maybe something on GitHub and what's the licensing like? Right. So, you know, the, the LMU and everything is patented by the company, by ABR. Um, it's free to use for commercial or for non-commercial purposes. And then if you want to use it commercially, you just have to contact us and we can, you know, talk to people about licensing it. But there is a, a you know publicly available uh, Keras library, so Keras LMU. So if you just search for Keras and LMU, then you'll find the library, and you can use it and integrate it into TensorFlow models quite easily. Um, there's also a PyTorch version. It's not as sort of uh, well developed as the Keras version, so I kind of generally recommend the Keras one. But if you prefer to PyTorch, then there's also implementations in PyTorch. Okay. Sounds good. Well, we've had an awful lot of questions. There's been a lot of interest in your talk. Uh, so yeah, um, awesome. uh, if you have other talks in you, like you sound like you had some interesting discussion points on the drone, I think we'd be very happy to hear about that if you'd like to uh, come back and present another time on that. Thank you very much, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, if there's no other questions, anything from ACM people wanna make any other announcements or comments? I okay. guess not. Okay. Well, I'd like to close up tonight's talk and thank you very much. It was great to have you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Bill. Take care. Right. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye -bye.